Got your copy of God's Word. We'll be in 1 John chapter 4 this morning. 1 John chapter 4. And while everybody's turning there, I guess there is a little bit of a time limit, so I just don't feel like you have to rush through it. So there is a purpose to that. So we'll get to that in a little bit. So uh, basically, they're they're doing a little puzzle for me, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see how that that's going to help us here at the end. But First uh, John chapter four. And we're going to be looking at verses uh, 1 through 6 this morning. 1 John chapter 4, uh, John writes, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, uh, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come, uh, excuse me, is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is not of God. And uh, this uh, is that spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already, uh, it is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They, uh, they are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world bear- heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The title of the message this morning is Truth versus Feeling. Truth versus Feeling. Let's pray once again. Father, I thank you for this day and uh, for your word and just the opportunity we have to gather together, the time we have to open it, and I ask that you would use me at this time, uh, help all of us to have open hearts and, and, and uh, open minds to what you have for us, and, and uh, cause me to say what you want said, keep me from saying anything you don't want said this morning, and uh, if there's anybody here that's uh, doubting their salvation or needs to do business with you, uh, may today be, uh, be that moment. Uh, where somebody can uh, take some time and make things right with you. And may we take it seriously. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I like what somebody once said when they said that feelings aren't facts. Maybe you've had a situation where somebody said something to you or somebody looked at you a certain way and it produced anxiety or maybe even excitement. But the best thing to do when you're feeling like something is, isn't right is to check it out. And, and I don't always follow this, but uh, the advice that somebody gave is don't sit on it, uh, push it down, or try to ignore it. Your emotions won't cooperate. Sometimes the only way out is by getting into the feelings and first looking at how you might be creating them. I know I've done that. I know I've had a situation where somebody you know, looked at me a certain way or uh, uh, um, said something a certain way and I took it totally wrong, it's because I was creating that problem within myself. And then he goes on to say, combine that with some gentle, not ac- accusationary questioning of someone, or excuse me, of the person or people who you may believe uh, to be the cause. Look for truth and be open to see how it's possible that your feelings may not be accurate, it also can be helpful to get an outside perspective from someone that you trust. And one of the things that drove home to me about truth versus feeling sometimes is uh, when Charity and I worked with uh, senior adults uh, uh, at a church in Springfield, uh, I, I always thought that uh, for a while when we first started coming, going into that class, I thought that some of them just didn't want to be there. 
And, and I just didn't understand a lot of things. And what, what I understood over a course of just a couple of weeks by listening to prayer requests and just by talking that many of them were battling health issues that were going on in their lives. They wanted to be there. They loved their church. They, they loved us being in there as helpers. But uh, what, what sometimes hindered the, the communication there with, with truth versus feeling or, or, or even perception was the fact they were battling health issues. When I, when I learned that they were battling health issues and there was things like cancer going on, there was, we had one lady that uh, had um, Lou Gehrig's disease and, and it was a terrible thing to watch her go through that. But even when, when she was at her worst, we, we knew the truth of, of how she felt about us and how she felt about our church. So I share all that to say to you this morning that we need to understand there is a difference between truth and feeling. We may not always feel like doing something, but we know the truth and, and we know the consequences and the outcome of that. We may feel like doing something... And yet, we, when we understand the truth or the consequences of what might come of that, we don't partake in it because we understand that that's a feeling. And like I mentioned and touched on last week, the advice of follow your heart or basically follow your feelings is not good advice to give and it's not good advice to follow. And it leads down a dangerous and destructive path. You know, I used to think that the whole follow your heart thing I thought, man, when I get out of high school, when I get out of high school, that thing's going to be whipped. I'm just going to have that thing just nailed down. Then I went off to college. Okay, I thought, you know, once I get that piece of paper and I, and I wear that cap and gown, I'm going to have this thing whipped. And, and man, when, when, I, when I walked across that stage and got that piece of paper, I wanted to jump up and down. But I realized this, this idea of truth versus feeling, I don't have it whipped. Then I thought, you know, by the time I reach 30, I'll have that thing whipped. Didn't, didn't have it whipped. Then I thought, well, if I get more education, I'll have it whipped. Still didn't have it whipped. The truth of the matter is, church, truth versus feeling, we're going to have to battle it every day that we're here on this earth. We're going to have to battle it in our ministry. We're going to have to battle it in our church. We're going to have to battle it in our marriages. We're going to have to battle it in our relationships. We're going to have to battle it on the job. We're going to have to battle it no matter where we go. We're going to have to battle that idea of truth versus feeling. So there's three things I'd like to talk about this morning that can help us from this text. Help us to understand truth versus feeling. First of all, we need to see that there's a need for testing. We need to see that there is a need for testing. In verse 1, John writes, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Everybody that comes along and calls himself a preacher, calls himself a teacher, we shouldn't believe. Everybody that calls himself a Christian doesn't mean we should believe them. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We are never to assume that every experience or every demonstration of spiritual power even is not is necessarily from God. We must test spiritual experiences and to see if they are in fact from God. Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to test those things? And when I say testing, I'm not talking about just trying to trip people up. Okay? We need to test the, we need to do a testing because there's a lot of junk out there. Jesus himself even said in Matthew 24 and verse 5 for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You know, the Bible even talks about being tossed around in the winds of doctrine. And, and basically, if, if you don't know what to look for, and you, and you aren't testing the Spirit, you're going to get blown around. You're, you're not going to know what's going on. And John doesn't want that uh, for these people here. And, and uh, Jesus Christ doesn't want us to to uh, not understand those things. That's part of why we're doing discipleship on Wednesday nights and, and, and digging down a little deeper so that we know what kind of tests need to be given and what kind of questions we need to ask ourselves. Do not believe every spirit here. He's, he's saying don't believe every pastor or teacher. Not every t pastor or teacher should be believed. But he says to try them. 
which means to put them to the test for the purpose of approving. This isn't the idea of tripping someone up. When, when someone gets ordained, and when, when I got ordained, I, I sat before uh, four or five pastors. I can't remember how many were on the ordination board off the top of my head. I think it was four or five. And they asked me questions. They weren't trying to trip me up. They didn't say things like, explain the definition of propitiation and back it up with 15 verses and give 10 outlines. It wasn't something like that. They asked simple questions like, what do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about Jesus Christ and and His death for you? Um, What do you believe about the church? What do you believe about the blood? Why is the blood of Christ important? Those are just basic questions that they asked me to make sure that, I, that, I, that I'm someone that needs to be ordained because the Bible says, and we don't have time to go into it because it's a whole separate message, but to not, not to suddenly lay hands on any man, but to ask certain questions. You know, tests are common in, in uh, many areas of life. Students must pass an ACT or an SAT test to enter college. I remember taking that. And uh, I don't know what I got the second time. I remember the first time I took it, I got like a 19, which isn't a very good score at all. And I'll be honest with you, it was on a Saturday morning, and I went into that test just trying to get it over with, just as a check mark to say I did it. And then when I came here, there was for some reason there was no record that I took it. I don't know how it got lost, but I had to retake it. Uh, at, at BBC, and I remember getting frustrated by that, and I don't know what I got, but it was good enough to where they didn't kick me out. So they let me stay. Uh, there's other kind of tests. You know, when I call my credit card company to make a payment, or I want to secure some, uh, uh, some information uh, from, about my account, they put me to a test. They ask me for the four, the four digits of my social security number. They ask my zip code. Uh, they might they ask questions like, uh, what's your mother's maiden name? So that, that is a test because they are trying to authenticate my identity. You know, the test is designed in that situation to weed out inappropriate or false callers. You know, teachers are required to pass a teacher's exam in order to get a teacher certificate. You can't just say... I want to be a teacher. You can't walk into uh, Greenfield High School and say, I want to teach. No, there's a testing that has to go on to make sure that you are certified and that you're capable of teaching that. You can't just go up there and carry a stack of books and say, yeah, if I think I want to teach here, they, they will just laugh at you and say, you know, we like your, your well intentions, but you need to go through the proper process of being tested. And we need to understand that, that there's a need for testing because deceivers are real. You know, there's a lot of smooth talkers out there. That's one thing I, I cannot claim. I cannot claim that I'm a smooth talker. Because, you know what, guys? I could not sell shoes to somebody that's barefoot. Somebody told me one time, why don't you get into sales? I'm not good at sales. I would have to buy into something so much that I would be willing to bet my whole life on it, and there's really not a whole lot of things for sale, that I would just want to put all my efforts and, and, and all my oomph and everything I am into it, except for preaching the gospel. Okay? I, I, I couldn't sell boats, because I don't think everybody needs a boat. So I'd have a hard time going and selling a boat to somebody that probably can't afford it and doesn't need it. I, 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 that's just not who I am. I cannot sell cars. Because you know what? I don't think cars today are made as good as cars 10 or 15 years ago. So I'm not good at selling cars. I mean, we're, I mean, we're, we're looking at failure here down the line if I were to try to go into sales. I, I am who I am. I, I'm pretty much, I, I try to be anyhow the same person at home that I am here. I, I am not a smooth talker. In fact, when I'm trying to figure out how to word things, I usually run it past my wife. Because I'm kind of rough around the edges and Charity's kind of the one that's a little more polished. And kind of knows how to say things that are going to be received a little bit better than the way sometimes I might receive something. You know, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, Peter says this, Knowing this first, that those shall come in the last days, and by the way, I think we're probably looking at being in the last days of the last days. 
Listen to what he says if you're going to come. Scoffers. Do a Bible study sometime on scoffers. Get a dictionary. Get a uh, Strong's Concordance. And in a couple weeks, we're going to actually on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about how to use one of those if, if you don't know how to use one. It's an incredible tool that can open up things for you and, and really help you to dig into God's Word, but that's a, something for a different time. Scoffers walking after their own lusts. We see a lot of that. You know, th- this isn't hard to get, guys. This is stuff that you just turn on the TV, you can see it. You drive into town. You can see it. People walking after their own lusts. You know, one of the things that, that's rampant in our area is, is different addictions. It's not judging folks, but there's somebody that's walking after their own lust, Somebody that needs the love of God in their life. Somebody that needs Jesus Christ. Because you know what? Without Christ, you and I would be walking after our own lusts. There's a whole bunch of lusts that I would be partaking in if not for Christ. He goes on to say, in saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And when he talks about deceivers here, back to 1 John, he says that there are many false prophets are gone out into the world. You know, these are people that may have started out in the church and then left. I'm not going to name names because I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's very edifying. But I know people, and I'm sure you do too, that in the church, they were in the church, they were in the pew, they were singing the songs, they were putting money in the offering plate. They may have taught a Sunday school class, they may have stood behind a pulpit somewhere and preached God's word, but they're not in the church now. Secondly, we see there's a process for testing. A process for testing. Look at verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. How do you know Him? Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come uh, in the flesh is of God. And in verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this uh, is that spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard it should come. And even now, already, it is in the world. So the testing process is to be done here with the hope of someone passing the test and then leading others to Christ. So just like when someone wants to join our church, we, we ask questions like, have you, have you been saved? Have you been baptized? Are you coming from you know, another church of, of like faith and practice? We don't do those things to, to try to hold anyone back, but there's a testing ground that, we, that we're hoping someone passes so that they can join with us and point others to Christ. And then also to help others mature in Christ. Demonic influence or demonic possession. I know that's, that's something that we don't talk a lot about, but it's real. And it is a reason for those who do not pass this test because Satan is the father of all lies or untruths. The straightforward test given by John is does the person or the spirit here, their spirit, confess Jesus Christ and that He was God in the flesh? In the Word of God, we are warned against sitting in judgment of others, especially because we are encouraged not to cultivate or grow, you could say, a a, uh, critical and uncharitable spirit. But in the text here, Christians seem to be encouraged to exercise their, their uh, gift here of judgment and dis- dis- uh, discernment in another way. They are called upon to try the spirits whether they are of God. And we've all heard the argument before. Judge not, at least you be judged. We've all heard that. I've been guilty of saying it before. <laughs> To be honest, listen, I am, I am in the wrong if I am judging someone's motives. But we are to judge whether something's true or it's not. Now, if I sit here and, and say, you know, your motives on whatever you're doing are wrong, that's judgmental. But if you're teaching that uh, Jesus is not God in the flesh, then I have to take issue with that. I don't like taking issue with things. 
If you know me, I like to be non-confrontational. When I run into people at my job that don't belong there, I don't sit there and ID them and ask them 50 questions. I figure out where they're trying to go and help them get there. Get off of my campus, get, get, get out of my area, whatever. I want you to beat feet and be out of my life, okay? Not you, but somebody who's trespassing, okay? Uh, that's how I've handled that. So, I'm not somebody that likes to make a whole bunch of confrontations. That's not what I focus on. But when there's error that's, that's, that comes up, we are called to deal with that. God wants us to, in a very loving and a very gracious way, He wants us to handle error. And if we handle the error in a loving and gracious way, one of two things is going to happen. Either that person is going to turn from their error and they're going to thank you for taking their, the time, or they're going to go out from you and it's a sad thing, it's not something we want to happen. But sometimes it has to happen so you can continue on. David and I have talked about how sometimes in our Baptist circles, how sometimes there's splits. And it's not like, oh goody, here's another split. You know, I'm going to split the covey. I'm going to split the covey like a covey of, of quail, you know. I'm going to split the covey. That's not, that's not our heart here. I know that's not your heart. But when someone's preaching and teaching error, and they go out, we, we might be being spared further hurt down the road and we don't know it. You know, I've used the illustration before. When I get in a hurry and I get mad at somebody driving five miles under the speed limit and my wife will remind me, maybe God's using this slow driver to keep us from getting into a wreck. Usually I say that's not true, but you never know. Where's the focus at? Uh, John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, Jesus tells us this about the Spirit, and we looked at this on Wednesday nights. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, for whatsoever He shall hear, that he, uh, shall He speak, and He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, and He shall receive of Mine, and show unto you all things that the Father hath or Mine. Therefore said I, he shall take of mine, and so shall show it to you. So He's going to help with your focus. He's going to help put your focus where it needs to be at. What do they believe? What do they confess? Today there's many groups that uh, deny Jesus is really God. And when I say groups that deny Jesus is really God, I have to point these out. Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Muslims. Those are the top ones. That, Folks, those are people that deny... Jesus is God. They deny His deity. You know, way back in John's day, it was a time where people were the closest to actual life and ministry of Jesus Christ on this earth. So people didn't really... There wasn't a whole lot of struggle there. There was probably some, but there wasn't like we have today of the struggle of believing that Jesus was God. They had a hard time instead believing that He was a real man. This false teaching said that Jesus was truly God, which is correct, but they went on to say that He was a make-believe man, which was false. And we know that, that that's false teaching because in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that one verse says that the Word was made flesh, meaning that God became man. Okay? And then he goes on to say, there the, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So he came from the Father, and then it says that he was made flesh. That one verse shows the, the, the duality here of Christ that He was 100% man and He was 100% God. How is that possible? Because God did it. That's why it's possible. It's not possible because you and I can explain genetics. It's only possible because God said so. I know we don't like that. You know, when, as a parent, your kids don't like it as a, when a parent says, because I said so. That's because God said so. That's one of those things. God said it, it settles it. Okay, that's, that's it. Red flags to look for. It is the Spirit which both opposes the true 
Jesus and offers a substitute Jesus, the devil doesn't care at all if you know Jesus or love Jesus or pray to Jesus, as long as it is a false Jesus or a make-believe Jesus, a Jesus who is not there and who therefore can't save. Second John chapter 1 and verse 7, John later in his second letter writes this, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. In Matthew 24, 24, Jesus goes on to say, For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch, excuse me, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Listen, if we're not on guard, if we're not issuing these tests, we're going to be deceived. Jesus said, if you're not on guard, you're going to be deceived. Thirdly and lastly this morning, There's the results of the testing. Look at verse 4. The results of the testing. John says this to believers. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore uh, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that uh, is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So he wants you to know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Testing will always reveal something. Tests reveal what we either know or we don't know. They They reveal something usually not easily seen. So we see here with the results of testing, we see here fear or victory. Fear or victory. The child of God here doesn't need to fear uh, the spirit of the Antichrist, even though they should be warned of it because uh, they have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. The believer has a resource here for victory that John is pointing out, the vital presence of the indwelling Jesus, which makes uh, always, excuse me, makes victory possible. If we rely on He who is in you instead of ourselves. We talked about Wednesday night, By His Spirit. Once again, I'm not a salesman. I'm not very good at trying to convince people of a lot of things. So if we have growth here, if people come here and visit, people come here and join, it's because of God. It's not because of my cool salesman-like slickness, because I don't have any. The results of testing, John exposes here true fellowship or biblical separation. When he says here in verse 5, they are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. And then he goes on in verse 6, the last part, he that is not of God heareth not us. But before that, he says, we are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. So there's True fellowship versus biblical separation here. Those who are of God truly enjoy fellowship with other believers. They speak the common language of fellowship with God, with each other, because one flows from the other. Amos 3.3, a famous verse there says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? How can two get work done if they, if they can't agree on the common goal? You ever seen people try to work together when their goal's different? They don't get very much work done, do they? If one says, we need to shovel the hay, and someone else is over here saying, we need to plant crops, they're not going to get a whole lot done because they're not of the same goal there. The language of fellowship, it goes above and beyond language, culture, class, race, or any other barrier. We need to understand about fellowship. I may preach a message on this sometime coming up, but uh, fellowship is a true gift from God. When we have fellowship, and, and, and I know we enjoy fellowship, we need to remember that that's a gift from God. When we forget it's a gift from God, we, we lose sight of its uniqueness. Because friends... I'm not pointing fingers, but not every church enjoys fellowship. And I don't say that arrogantly. 
I don't say that with a smile on my face. I say it because it's real and because I love you enough to bring up the fact that not everywhere experiences fellowship and when we have good fellowship, we need to treasure it and we need to thank God for it. I'm guilty of that. So I'm preaching to myself that I need to thank God for our fellowship more. I need to appreciate it more. I need to value fellowship here more than I value my phone in my pocket. I need to understand that it's a unique and it's a special thing. And we need to treasure it. The results of testing here, the discernment of truth. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 The author there writes this, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There will always be some people who listen to false teachers because those with worldly minds like to listen to worldly ideas. God's people would rather listen to truth. I'm not going to have my spiritual senses tuned in on truth just going and doing my own thing. I need the local church to help me. You know, I'm glad David reads a little verse before the service. That helps my thinking sometimes and it puts some thoughts and ideas into my head that I need to have there before I step up here. We need to remember that the idea of being a Christian, the idea of calling on Christ to save us, it's not the idea of us being a Lone Ranger Christian and just gutting at it by ourselves. That's not the intention there. In closing, Elizabeth Elliot wrote this. And Elizabeth Elliot, for those of you who don't know, she, uh, her hus- she was a missionary uh, in South America for many years. Her husband was killed by the very people who she was a missionary to. She wrote this, The difficulty is to keep a tight rein on our emotions. They may remain, but it is not they who rule the action. They have no authority. A life lived in God is not lived on the plane of feelings, but of the will. When we let our feelings lead the way, we end up making a lot of unwise, ungodly, and self-focused decisions and making a mess of our lives. We also become prone to picking and choosing our truth, receiving things that make us feel good, and then rejecting things that don't. When we accept only parts of God's truth that appeal to us this morning, they appeal to us personally, we dismiss and we dismiss all the rest. We can't receive the whole counsel of God as mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verse 27. We end up with distorted truth of our own making. And this is why so many of our churches today promote a soft, flimsy gospel instead of a powerful, life-transforming one. So we need to understand this morning truth versus feeling. Listen, not, not every feeling is wicked and of the devil. Not everything that somebody says is truth is actual truth. You know, this week there was a, a map posted of, you know, that there's a hurricane brewing out in the Atlantic right now. Somebody posted a map and it and it it just made me mad. They they posted a map of this hurricane heading right for Texas. After those people are cleaning up, going through a horrible situation down there, and somebody posted that map of it heading right to Texas when there's not a single forecast even hinting to that. Everybody's even said we can't even forecast it yet. So many people believe that. We live in a day where it's so easy. To be, get deceptive. People put things out on Facebook. They put things out on YouTube. They put things out on this website, this blog, whatever. It doesn't always make it true. So friend, as we leave here today, continue grounding yourself in the Word. Continue, continue on. So that we're not deceived. And we're not easily led astray. Let's pray. Father, I thank You.